Good evening. Welcome to our Old Testament studies. We're in chapter 46, headed toward that 50th and final chapter of Genesis before we'll move into Proverbs. Long about, oh, I guess it'll put us into August, close to September here. 46 is going to go pretty fast, but I'm going to take you to a couple other places. I hope you got your Bible with you because I'm going to show you something really cool out of uh, Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Luke that all go together. It just shows how over a period of 1,600 years, different people that spoke different languages and lived in different parts of the world. And when this Bible all came together, you can see the hand of God all the way through it. It's God who sewed it all together for us here. Chapter 46. Israel, or Jacob, is on his way. Uh, move, it's moving day. The famine's so bad up in the... Canaan, that Joseph sent his brothers back with wagons, and they're going to move the whole family down to Egypt to stay. Probably they thought they was just going until the famine was over, but they ended up being here for centuries. But uh, God used Egypt for an incubator for the nation Israel. It was down there that the nation exploded, and before he took them back to the promised land, you got to read the book of Exodus to get that story. Chapter 46 of Genesis, though, and Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. And he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. He don't know what to do, so he, what's he going to do? He's worshiping the Lord. And in worship, as often it happens, we find guidance from the Lord. And God spoke. God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I'm God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down to Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And I will go down with thee into Egypt. Remember, Jacob's probably been thinking, I, God called my papa Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and put him in this land. And he was, made all these promises that the descendants was going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the beach. So said, should I really go off down into Egypt now? And so he's seeking guidance. And God says, yes, I'm going to make that nation out of you down there. I'll go down with you to Egypt, and I'll surely bring you up again. <laughs> You're coming up again. That would be the nation. Isaac, or Jacob didn't, other than his bones. He got buried back in the promised land, but he went down to Egypt, we find out later, and he died there. And Joseph shall put his hand upon your eyes, or that, that boy that you thought died decades ago, said he's still alive, and said you're going to go down and see him, and he's going to be with you when you die. And Jacob raised, rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh sent them, remember they say Pharaoh sent wagons, wheeled vehicles that they didn't have to move them down to Egypt during this, which Pharaoh sent to carry them. And they took their cattle and their goods which they'd gotten in the land of Canaan, and they came into Egypt. Jacob and all of his seed or all of his descendants with him. Because by now he's got to be, he's an old man, Jacob is. We, we started studying about Jacob when he was just a, a young boy fighting with his brother Esau over the birthright and run off and all that time we spent with Jacob down when he was living with Uncle Laban all them years and he picks up the two wives and the two concubines and has all these children and comes back. You know, we've been with Jacob a long time through this book. But by now he's ancient and he's got kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. and So Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons, his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters and all seed brought him into Egypt. Now, verse 8 starts one of those genealogies that uh, most people just skip over and get on down here. We're going to do that too, but it's there for a reason. It's important because uh, it's the genealogy or the ancestral tree of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll run into many of these same people. If you look over in Matthew chapter 1, it's how the New Testament starts. Here's the genealogy of Jesus. Also, you can find it in Luke chapter 3. So it's important because it's showing how the Messiah came into the world through this line of people here, that line that God told Abraham long ago that all the nations of the world were going to be blessed through him. So we'll skip over leaving verse 8 here. If you want to read down your own and do some study and comparison, you can. And we'll drop on down to verse 26. After he gets all that long list, of, here's the roles of the people that, that went down there. It's kind of like a, 
I've been looking at some stuff on the on the internet from the, the Cherokee rolls when they were moved out of this country or to the Oklahoma Territory. You know, there was a long list of the names of the people that went. Sort of the same thing here in Genesis with Jacob's family for a different reason, though. But verse 26, all the souls which came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls, King James says, were three score and six. That's 66. A score is 20. Three score is 60. Plus six is 66 people went down there with him. Plus, we got some plus now. And then his descendants also counted. He had some already down there in Egypt, right? The sons of Joseph, which were born in Egypt, were, were two souls. 66 plus two now makes 68, and which came into Egypt. And eventually... If the sentence ends, there were three score and ten, that's 70. So I think that's that 68 plus the two grandchildren that belonged to Joseph. Make 68 plus Joseph plus Jacob. You add all that together and you get three score and ten. That's 70. Now, we're going to hold our place right here for a minute. And I'm going to do some study in these other places in the Bible and show you something really neat. Hundreds of years they stay down here in Egypt. These generations die off and more are born and, you know, eventually another Pharaoh's in charge that uh, didn't even know Joseph and they've turned them into slaves when you get over in Exodus after centuries go by and they start praying to God to get them out of that mess. And that's what the story of Exodus is about, how Moses, God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses to lead them in the Exodus, the exit, if you would, out of Egypt on back up to where they're supposed to be in the promised land. And when they came out of Egypt, there's over a million of them now. Seventy of them went down. Now there's over a million of them coming back out. And in my mind, I see old Moses. He gets up on a big old rock out there in the, in the desert somewhere because he's trying to speak to this whole multitude of people. I'm sure he's just yelling at the top of his voice. And he makes this speech to them that you can find in Deuteronomy 10. We won't read the whole speech, but just the end of it here, that uh, Moses reminds them in Deuteronomy 10:22 said, your fathers, which say your forefathers, went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons, that original 70 that went down there. And Moses is looking out that great multitude of over a million people, shoulder to shoulder out through there, and he, he says, and now the Lord thy God has made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. See, he knew the promise that God had been making Abraham way back there. That he's going to make that family like the stars of heaven and stand on the beach. So Moses stands up there and looks out at them. And Moses is thinking inside, God did it. He kept his word. He did exactly what he said he would do. He's turned that 70 into this big crowd. And he's brought us back out here. And I want to tell you something. God smiled at him. Because God says, Moses, in God's mind, he's thinking, Moses, you think I've done it. But this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. We can't, uh, the, the, be, the more we can comprehend God, I think the bigger God is, the more we realize we can't comprehend all the, the greatness and the goodness of God. But Moses thought that he had. But now turn with me over to your New Testament out of Deuteronomy 10, holding your place in Genesis back there. And we'll go over to, uh, from Deuteronomy 10 to Luke chapter 10. And in Luke chapter 10, most New Testament Christians know this story, but they don't know the question, that Jesus sent 70 people out originally, two by two. And you think, well, where did he get that number? Well, that's God's number, right? Seven, seven times 10, or he just drew it out of the air somewhere. Why did he send 70? And verse 1 of Luke 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also disciples, and he sent them two and two before his face, into every city and place whither he himself would come. And they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom that the, that the Messiah has come. And then they go out and they have, they have uh, results and they're happy and they're joyous and they come back to the Lord in verse 17 of Luke 10. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And then the Lord warns them, says, well, don't be so excited about that. He said, the best thing that's ever happened to you, he said, be excited that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But there's that 70 again. Now you think about that for just a minute. 
Moses saw that 70 before his mind turned into over a million and said, God's done it. He's telling them in that speech, God's made us like the stars in heaven. And then, as I said, God must have smiled at him because Jesus, the New Testament, Moses was a type of the New Testament, Jesus. And Jesus sends out 70. And guess what? Every human being since that day that Jesus sent those 70 out is becoming another one of those stars in heaven or the sand on the beach. The entire church of God, Old Testament, New Testament together, is part of that promise. And Paul reminds us when we flip on a little bit farther to the epistles, said it, it ain't about your DNA. He's not a Jew, which is one outwardly. He's a Jew, which is one inwardly, because we're the children of Abraham by faith. We Christians, whether you're Gentile or Jew, if you believe in Jesus, then you're part of that 70 that become the stars, like the stars in heaven, the sand on the beach, an innumerable multitude. And if somebody else believed just now, another star or another grain of sand coming to the church until the Lord comes back, that's going to continue to happen. Now you see why I said God had to smile at Moses when he made that speech. Moses thought he had it all figured out. And now I'm standing before you thinking I've got it all figured out and God's probably smiling again. So it's a lot bigger than you even think about. And uh, I trust that that's true. The main thing is I hope that you, by believing the gospel, are one of them stars or one of them sands on the beach. So back to 28 now. Back in Genesis 46, 28. That's where we left off. And he sent Judah before him to Joseph to direct his face to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen, along the Nile where all the grass grew so well. There's a purpose of that because they're bringing their flocks with them. And Joseph made ready his chariot. There's a lot in that. I can picture old Joseph. He's going out to see his daddy that he hadn't seen in 30-something years, I think it is. And when he says he made ready his chariot, I bet he washed that thing, had it cleaned up and detailed and shined just good and found the best horses in the stable and hooked up to it. He's going to meet his daddy, and he's riding to this big chariot. You know, he's the vice president of Egypt. And he went to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck, and he wept on his neck. The Bible says a good while. All these years they hadn't seen each other. They just hugged one another for a long time. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I've seen thy face. I'm an old man. I can go on now knowing that you're still alive because you aren't yet alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and unto his father's house, I'll go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come to me, and the men are shepherds. See, that's important. Where he's locating them is where the shepherds need to be for a couple reasons. One, it's the best place for shepherds, the grassy place. The other thing is, he's going to say, because the Egyptians don't really like the shepherds. For their trade's been to feed cattle, and they've brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. They've moved down here permanently for at least a good while. And it'll come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you, and he'll say, what's your occupation? That you'll say, thy servant's trade has been about cattle from our youth even to now, both we and our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, the grassy place. And then he says, the last sentence of the chapter here, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now, when you run across that word in the Bible, abomination, that means that's something that's disgusting. There's a lot of things in the Bible that God says is an abomination to him. He says that's disgusting to him. Now, in this case, the Egyptians, Egypt in the Bible is always like a type of the world, a type of unbeliever. See, God's growing his church in the world now, and he's going to take them to the promised land. But in this case, it says the, all the shepherds were abominations to the Egyptians. Now, you can, you can just bet on it, it's a figure of speech, that Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, as he called himself, is an abomination to unbelievers today. Just listen to the way they talk about him. But our job is to convince them that they're on the wrong side and that they need to be on the shepherd's side. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See you next week.